You know, as Christians, starting today, we are a week away from the greatest event in the history of the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, many of you may know, is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday commemorates when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey right before his death, if you're not aware of that. And I would like for us, we're going to look at mainly one piece of scripture this morning. So if you would join me, we're going to be in the book of Matthew. And we're going to look at Matthew's account of what happened on Palm Sunday. So Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 1, if you would join me there this morning. I know you're saying, man, you didn't do anything else. We're just going to get right into it. That's just this morning the way we're going to do it. Pray you brought your Bibles with you once again. Let's take God's word for it. Let's not take mine. Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and once you, once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that uh, followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You know, that one thing that stands out in this piece of scripture, and, and I, I, I'm sure it, it stands out to us, it stood out to them in the day, is Jesus came in riding just a donkey. They expect him to come in on a big white horse, just flaming arrows and everything. They expected something different than what they were getting. But they were still excited because, as according to prophecy, all this was falling in place, and they got really excited, and they got stirred up about it. You know, it didn't matter what he was riding at the time, but it wasn't what they expected at the time. They expected something more powerful, something that stood out, you know, something that made a statement. Well, Jesus was making a statement, but it wasn't the statement they wanted to see or hear. What happened some 2,000 years ago, this next week changed everything. It changed all of history, and it changed all of creation. It changed the very present and the eternal destiny of human mankind. What happens next week? When Jesus Christ gave his life as a ransom and as a sacrificial love offering for all of us, it radically transformed everything in the world immediately. Jesus made a way through his death and resurrection for every person born on earth to have eternal life. Amen. He made a way for us to experience human life in a whole new way, with a whole new set of eyes, by being cleansed and purified by the Holy Spirit. Brother, he made a way that we could look at life not just as a negative way. He made it where we could look at life in a positive way, which was pretty tough back in the day. This was a week that Abraham and Sarah, King David, Isaiah, and all the prophets had looked forward with, with anticipation. All looked forward to the, uh, the Christ coming and and fixing everything that was going on in the world. They were all excited about that. And this was the week that Jesus would begin the final steps of his mission here on earth. And all of this brings us back to Palm Sunday. It's the anniversary of the day Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. As many of his followers surrounded him with praise, prophecies, prayers, and palm branches. I mean, they were excited. 
his followers, the, even the followers he didn't have yet, now he's got more. And they are praising him. They're excited. The city's on fire. They know something's about to happen. And they're looking forward to it, and they're all excited. And Palm Sunday remembers when Jesus rode in on that donkey as foretold in prophecy that's found in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and Zechariah. The people wanted an insurrectionist to topple Rome. But Jesus didn't come to defeat an enemy. But not the one, he did come to defeat an enemy, but not the one they had in mind. Instead, he came to defeat the enemy of sin that ensnares every man and woman in life here on earth. So he came for a different reason than what they were believing he was there for. And a question asked is, why the people, why did the people, why did they wave palm branches and, and lay them at the feet of Jesus' cult? What was that all about? And no doubt in Palestine, where Jesus ministered, they had plenty of palm trees scattered throughout the land. That was the probably one of the main trees at the time. And according to Eastern Bible Dictionary, the branches in the trees actually had a significant meaning. People didn't just grab whatever leaves they could find for no reason. Rather, you're not going to see any oak leaves, oak trees, uh, cedar trees, all that. They grabbed these leaves for one specific reason. The branches are a symbol to them and to Christians, a symbol of victory. The palm tree can reach heights as much as 80 feet. Normally, they're from 40 to 50 feet, but they can get as high as 50 feet. And its branches, they can draw, they can be from anywhere from 6 feet to 12 feet in length while bending down from the top of the tree. And the palm tree catches the eye of everyone. Everywhere you see one, it'll catch your eye. You can't look away from it because they're that magnificent. And that's why they stood out so much. And there are many meanings and symbols that were associated with the palm tree. Its image was carved on the doors, the doorposts, and on the walls of the temple at the time. It was one of the most visible symbols pointing back to the Garden of Eden, to the life here on earth, and to everlasting life to come. Rather, the palm tree or the palm branches meant something. It was a symbol that gave the people hope. In Revelations, it's one of the trees that the Apostle John sees growing by the crystal waters on the new earth. Archaeologists share with us that the palm tree was seen as a sacred tree by other tribes of people including Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, and even the Romans. There was something mystical and spirit special about the palm tree that appealed to the ancient man's spirituality. There was a connection with man in this tree. And there are many different kinds of palm trees, but this one in this area was known as the date palm tree. It had the ability to grow in the hot and harshest climate and weather of the Middle East. And another unique feature about the date palm tree is that the way it grows and where its heart's located. The date palm grows from its center. Rather, it grows from inside out, not like many other trees. Have you ever seen what happens when someone puts a wire around an oak tree? Or, you know, when you build fences and you decide you're going to build a barbed wire fence and you're going to use that tree as one of the posts, and you drive nails into it to hold that wire there. Well, over a period of time, the oak's tree bark will grow over that wire and consume it, and it will become part of the tree. And it actually looks like uh, the wire is growing out of the tree because it's consumed it so much. And it just takes a matter of years before it does that. The date palm tree, on the other hand, is very different because it grows from the inside out. If you put a wire around a date palm tree, instead of the wire becoming part of the tree, the tree will grow and expand until it breaks the wire. I didn't know that till today. This is the way we grow in faith. We grow from our hearts. We grow from drawing on the strength and the Holy Spirit the Lord has put inside of us. So we grow from inside out, just like the tree. And it seemed that the people of God wanted to be like the date palm tree. They wanted to, be, wanted to be living and growing inside. And they wanted Christ to be part of that. So they wanted to be like that. So with all that said, and we talk about all that, and many of you know what happened. 
What happened after Jesus was greeted on that day where they were all excited and praising him? Giving the shouts to him. I mean, he was had it going on. What happened on that day when all that went on and he rode into the city? What happened that changed the mood of his followers? It's really a fairly simple explanation. It's not complicated at all. The Jewish people wanted victory. Victory over the Romans who had invaded their land. Jesus did come to exact a victory, but not quite the one they had in mind. Rather, they had two different things going on then. They had these great expectations of Jesus. They praised him for two reasons. One, because he performed miracles. And just before he arrived in Jerusalem, he had just performed the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And that's something that, uh, you know, that's something you just can't keep quiet. Word had gotten around, this went on, that Jesus had done this. So they praised him for that because he was a man of miracles. And they were thinking, well, this man, this man can make our lives better by freeing us from the political oppression of the Romans. So that's what they were looking for. They were looking for someone like that. They were looking for that miracle. The problem was that Jesus, he did not perform another miracle once he went inside the walls, once he reached the city of Jerusalem. And his teachings that he had while he was there, once he got there, they were serious and they were tough. And this is not what the people wanted to hear at all. The second thing, the reason they praised him was because of prophecy being fulfilled. This was all prophesied. So they had praise for him, but all at once, he wouldn't tell them what they wanted to hear. Aren't we that way today? God's not doing what we want him to do. He's not telling us what we want to hear, and he's not following our instructions. And it becomes a problem with us sometimes. We find ourselves drawing away from Christ and criticizing Christ. Even as good Christians, that can happen. And Lord, why do you allow this to happen to me? And why is this going on in my life? Don't kill us, don't make us stronger, amen? And we all seem to all still be here, right? I guess everybody's alive in here. I, I don't know. It's See, Jesus, he teaches mostly at this time on submission and commitment. He's not teaching or preaching on what they want to hear. This is something, you know, it's not the message they expected from the Messiah. They expected something that's going to get them on fire and he's going to preach and talk, tell them all about what he's going to do with the Romans and how he's going to fix all this stuff. That's not what he's doing. And that's sure not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to know how he was going to make their lives easier. They wanted to hear about getting rid of the problem, the Romans. That's what they were focused on. And Jesus did come to make our lives better. Maybe not necessarily to make them better, but to help us deal with the problems so our life could get better. But not in the way we expect. You know, we want Jesus to make our lives better, but many people are confused in that issue because they want their life to get better in the way they expect. They want more possessions. That's one of the two, two things they want. I need more possessions. I need more money. I need more of this. That's what's going to make my life better. That's where we lose sight of things. Right there, it's real easy to do. Our life gets better when we submit and our commitment to Jesus Christ. When he is inside of us and we're changing inside and we're growing outward. He's in our daily walk, our daily life. That we learn to lean on him and not on the world. That we look for something better in our lives. And the way we find that is peace among ourselves. You know, you go, well, you got to deal with the world. You know, the world's there, people around you. You know, it's not that easy. Yes, it is. It is. It's the way we deal with it, and that's what went on here. Jesus wasn't dealing with this problem the way that they wanted it dealt with. But he knew what the people needed, and it wasn't for him to deal with this. 
It was for them to learn how to deal and live in that society the way it needs to be done. To live with one another and love one another. We lose sight of that sometimes because of the way things are. You know, we say our prayers today. We, we, want, we want God to come right now and clean this mess up going on in this world. Amen? We all want that. How do we know that God's not saying, hey, this is a learning experience for you. This is a time we're going to learn that if you submit and commit to me and lean on me, things will get better. You say, it's not that easy. Well, I guess it's, it's not easy. Walking with God daily is not easy. Getting in your Bible and studying and reading, that's not easy. You've got to want to do it. So how much of this world do we take before we decide, hey, we're going to do this because we want to do it. And this is what we need. Because the world's not going to give you what you need. At the end of your life, the world's going to go away. And there's only one thing left. And that's heaven or hell. And it's your choice. We get to make that choice. Isn't that great that we get to make that choice? And I'll tell you right now, there's some people not making a good choice. And they're probably going to leave this earth still not making a good choice. But we do have the choice. Thank the Lord for that. Because we don't deserve anything that he, he's been to us. We don't deserve that God sent his son to die on the cross to cover our sins for our stupid mistakes and shortcomings, right? We don't deserve that. That's how much God's love is. How much he cares for us. Jesus' mission wasn't to make us good people. That wasn't what he was here for. To make us good people. His mission was for us to learn to deal with the burden of sin that has infected our lives and try to change that. To overcome that. And that was through him. That's what he, his mission was. Just like people of that day, we believe that Jesus is wonderful. Wonderful. We sat here this morning, we hear praise and worship music and all, and we believe that Jesus is wonderful. Especially when he comes to make our life easier to bear in today's world. But it comes a different matter totally when submission and commitment come into play. Oh, yeah, we want all Jesus in our life. As long as I don't have to submit or commit to him. As long as I don't have to do anything involving him. All I got to do is show up and sit in these seats. That's all I got to do. I'm good with it. But if I have to go beyond that, man, you're going to have to count me out. I got other things going on. <laughs> Tell that to Jesus. <laughs> He'll give you a lot of other things going on in your life. Amen. If we're not willing to submit and commit our lives to Jesus, then we chose the life we're living with. Amen? And if you're living with a life that you don't like, today's the day you can change it. You have the same opportunity as anyone else. You have the same connection with Jesus Christ as anyone else. Don't, don't think that me or the elders or leaders in this church have that direct line to Jesus Christ, you have the same line. And he'll answer the phone whether you call or I call, right? Same way. It's no different. But you got to have that connection. And you got to have that commitment, commitment and be willing to submit your life to Jesus Christ. And just like the people of the day, they had, they had the mighty power of the Holy Spirit in them. They had that going on. But it also appeared clear they couldn't do it on their own. They couldn't do things on their own without the Holy Spirit, without Christ. They found that out real quick. Well, we can't overcome what's going on in our lives, even though we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can't beat this thing. Maybe not. But maybe you can learn to deal with it. Maybe you can learn to deal with it in a way that will keep our life grounded and focused. You know, they tried. They tried on the day of Jesus' triumphal entry. They tried as hard as they could and then failed a few days later because of their misguided expectations that they had of Jesus. That's why they failed. They really didn't understand 
what Jesus' mission is. And I think sometimes we have that same thing going on in our lives. Maybe we really don't understand what Jesus' mission is. Or was at the time. And what is it now? Well, do we even know what our mission is? Do you? The Bible says that we are to go into the world teaching, preaching, and professing the Lord Jesus Christ and baptizing people in that way. Bring others to know him. We have a mission. Help people get sin out of their lives and look through a different set of eyes. Look through the eyes of Jesus Christ at the world and each other. Sometimes that's tough, right? You might have somebody that just, man, you just see them in a way that you can't see them any other way. Now, don't look at them if they're sitting by you. Come on. Right? Don't look at them. But Jesus gives us his eyes to look at things entirely different. A person may not be what we expect them to be, right? But they are who God made them. And if we look through them with the eyes of Jesus Christ, then we can see them in a whole different light. Do they have problems going on in their life? Yeah. Do we have problems going on in our life? Yeah. You know, I said the other day, have you ever met anybody oversaved? Don't look at your neighbors. So no, don't. If you don't know anybody like that, maybe somebody's thinking of you. But the deal is, we are never too holy for one another. We are never too good or, or such a great Christian that we don't have time for others. And sometimes we get caught up in that. I don't want to deal with that person. They got too much going on. Well, you don't have to live with them. And everybody's got a little drama going on in their life. You know, we don't choose to be part of that drama. But there are people with so many burdens and so misdirections and so many missed expectations in their life that they need some kind of guide. They need some kind of uplifting, some kind of encouragement in their life. And that's our job. That's what we should be doing. And every day I look at all different kinds of youth coming in. You know, we sit here and we look at kids with earrings all everywhere and all this stuff going on, crazy hair, the whole deal. What did we do when we were young? I had hair down to here. I was one of them little hippie guys at one time, right? Don't y'all act like y'all hadn't been there if you're my age. Had them crazy clothes on, did crazy things. Kids do crazy things. Any of you ever got on top of a car and surfed? Going down the road at 50 mile an hour? We do crazy things back then, and they do crazy things now. It just seems to us a little bit more of it, we've left Jesus out of the mix. You know, it's a little bit more out of control in our life now. But as our parents prayed for us, we need to continue to pray for our kids and grandkids, right? Pray for the young ones. Because the actually, the future of this church depends on the youth of today. Let's be that positive influence in their lives. And once again, let's try to understand them. But let's look at them through Jesus' eyes. Amen. These people here, they were no longer interested in submission and commitment. That's what changed everything. They were interested in having what they wanted and when they wanted it. We can be that way. I need this right now. You know, today we should move our wants, our expectations, and timelines out of the way of Jesus. And allow him to provide us with what he wants us to have. What his expectations are for us. And on his timeline alone, not our own. Having faith that he has our best interest in mind. Amen. So maybe if we did those simple three things, life would change for us. Get out of this rushing world. Fast paced thing going on. Step back. Be still and know that I am God. Right? Find a still quiet place. Have a conversation with God, one-on-one. -on -one. You may not hear him reply. You may not hear that audible sound. But you will get a clear mind and clear direction of what's going on at that time in your life.
Next week, we'll be celebrating once again, as Christians, one of the greatest events in the history of the world. The event that gave us hope for eternal life was the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we close here today, I pray we all reflect this next week and what our submission and our commitment looks like as we remember how much God loves us and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who submitted and committed his life for our sake that we would review our lives and where we stand with Christ at this time. He's an open door. He stands waiting with his arms wide open, waiting on us. He's got the patience we don't. All we have to do is call on him. It's easy as ABC. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Believe he sent his son to die on the cross to cover our sins and shortcomings. Commit your life to him. John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he's dead. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning in the same way with excitement and anticipation of our celebration next week, Father. We're thankful, Father, that uh, you joined us here today that your presence can be felt throughout this building. Father, we're thankful that you saw fit to send your son to die that horrible death on that cross for us to cover the sins and shortcomings in our lives. Father, we know at times we can be a mess, and we know at times we expect more out of you than you believe we need. But, Father, we believe that you know what we need, and we claim that today. And Father, you pray that you would heal this world, heal what's going on. Father, we'll stand by and wait on your time and just be still and listen to you. Father, we love you and praise you. Give the glory to you. In Jesus' name and precious name we pray. Amen.